G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here with what is it, episode uh, 16, 17, 18. Episode 18 in the partial book reading of One Rowdy Whore? No, not as such. One Crowded Hour. Biography of Neil Davis. Combat Cameraman. Written by Tim Bowden. First published in 1987. This is the 1989 reprint. Chapter 16 is The Man Who Liked Everybody. Okay, so we take up the story at a point where Neil Davis has just uh, thrown a Viet Cong flag out an office window in Saigon, and the two people in the room have nearly shit themselves with fear while they were colliding in midair trying to pull the flag back in before some of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam Soldiers in the streets decided to start shooting back in through the window. Got you, Revit, he said. I figured you'd be just as scared as Dima when the crunch came. A visit to the, quote, Bank of India, as Dima's modest operation became known to the Cognosienti, was more than a simple exchange of greenbacks into piastres. In the first place, the actual black market rate was usually a good indication of how the Allied war effort was going. The piastre would plunge in direct relationship to the state of the health of the South Vietnamese government. The Tet Offensive in 1968 caused a giant leap in the value of the US dollar. Bill Pinwheel remembers Dima gravely discussing the latest government reverses as his fingers sped expertly over his calculator. If the client queried the rate, alleging a better deal from a rival money changer down the street, Dima would often hold a muttered phone conversation with some mysterious overlord. It was widely believed among the press corps that the ultimate destination of the dollar bills, so changing hands, was Peking, via Saigon's Chinese quarter in Kowloon and Hong Kong. This posed an ethical problem for some in that they might be helping to provide hard currency for Red China, the Viet Cong's principal backer and supplier of arms. Another theory was that the CIA actually manipulated the currency black market. But such moral dilemmas did not greatly concern most foreign correspondents patronising the, quote, Bank of India, unquote. They considered they were entitled to a little profiteering as a return for the risks and discomfort they encountered in Vietnam. Although Davis had a living black market currency dealer, he did not make a habit of boosting his expenses for personal gain. In a war situation, most correspondents loaded things up a bit. But Davis's diaries record his expenses accurately and fairly. He was always a straight shooter on expenses, or that he was always a straight shooter on expenses, is confirmed by Bruce McDonnell, NBC's Asian manager for whom Davis worked in the post-Vietnam years. If he paid a dollar fifty to a bellboy to move his equipment, he could easily have put down, as everybody else did, $20. He always put down the dollar fifty. He just had no time for that kind of petty dishonesty. What Davis did with the money he saved, he revealed only to Aunt Lillian. Letter to Aunt Lillian, 11 November 1968, Hotel Mon Rom, Phnom Penh. I gave $4,000 to help war victims and orphans in Vietnam. I found somewhere I could be sure of that it would really help. I suppose many would say it was silly, but there you are. I felt like doing it, and I did it. Strange twist was that when I arrived in Cambodia and got my mail there, was a letter from a friend in Tasmania to say that the legal firm which handles my investments is really down the financial drain, and my money is as good as lost. So now I'm back to square one, I suppose. It is a bit of a blow, but I reasoned fairly quickly that I had the choice of jumping from the nearest high building or accepting fate with a laugh. I wasn't about to jump, but the funny side took a lot of seeing. It did indeed. Until 1968, Davis had invested his savings in property in Tasmania through the legal firm that collapsed in that year. But as he later told Aunt Lillian, I'm afraid I don't keep my money very long anyway. I have lots of Vietnamese friends here and just a few dollars can make a tremendous difference to them. One thing about the Vietnamese is that they accept gifts graciously and with genuine affection and don't mess things up with false pride. So I don't have much money but lots of friends and I'm glad to say they were friends before I was able to help them out financially. 
Most journalists and cameramen in Saigon force themselves to ignore the beggars and street children hustling or living on the pavements of downtown Saigon. Davis could not. Letter to Aunt Lillian, 28 January 1969, White's Hotel, London. I've had a letter from the Vietnamese girl who runs the Viz News office for me in Saigon. She said all the children of the streets keep coming up to the office and asking when I was coming back. They are the waifs who have been living on the streets as beggars, thieves, salesmen, anything at all since they were very young. Nearly all are orphaned by the war. They are great kids, although when we all go riding in my jeep, it becomes a handful. We seem to arrive back with all sorts of bounty, rather unnerving with all the police around. However, even they understand rather well. Traffic is so congested here that the kids take advantage of the traffic jams to relieve unwary commuters of anything loose. One of the street children was a little girl with a hauntingly beautiful face who used to hawk a tray of cigarettes around the streets. Balancing expertly on one crutch, her other hand supporting her meagre wares. Her right leg was withered and bent back around a pathetic flap of useless flesh. Some of this shit gets a bit hard to read. Sorry about the emotion in the voice. On 19 November 1969, Neil sent Aunt Lily in the newspaper clipping reproduced on page 209. Only Aunt Lillian knew that Neil had brought Tran Tai Sa to the attention of the Terre de Homs and helped to finance her journey to Germany for a series of operations. And to think that people put shit on war correspondents for being paid to film combat. This is what Neil Davis did with the money. Operation Saves Tot from Saigon. Frankfurt, Saigon. 11-year-old Tran Tai Sa is just one of Saigon's numberless cigarette vendors. But unlike most of the other preteen tots who make their living hawking smokes to GIs, Sa gets around on one good leg and a crutch. Her right leg is withered and practically useless. After years limping through war-torn streets, Sa came to the attention of Terre de Homs, a Swiss charitable organisation. The group agreed to send her halfway around the world, to Frankfurt, Germany, to have her crippled leg mended. The tiny black-eyed, tiny black-eyed, black-haired girl arrived in the orthopaedic clinic at the city hospital in Hoax, a Frankfurt suburb, on July 4. On July 22, doctors operated, then put her shriveled leg in a cast. Doctors hope a series of operations, plus the cast, will straighten out the leg. Apparently, Saar became confused while in the hospital. She wrote home and told her parents that in the second operation scheduled in three or four months, her bad leg would be amputated. Quote, she has it all wrong, said the clinic's chief. Dr. Wolfgang Berktold said, we certainly aren't going to cut her leg off. After the second operation, she will be able to walk and run on her own with both of her own legs. How many fucking combat soldiers ever spent their pay on rebuilding the orphaned victims of war? Huh? Ah, oh, fuck no. That was just the journalists who did that sort of thing. Letter to Aunt Lillian, 12 December 1969. Orange Grove Road, Singapore. Well, the little girl with a leg was injured in an explosion. I think, when she was very tiny, maybe about three, I think. It withered and never grew from then on. I was amazed that they said they could rejuvenate it because it's exactly similar to the useless limbs you have probably seen many times as a result of polio many years ago before Sister Kenny's methods changed things. Sister Kenny invented a method of treating polio victims before they developed a vaccine. One year later, little Tran Tai Sa was mentioned again. Letter to Aunt Lillian, 7 December 1970, the Oriental Hotel, Bangkok. 
A great surprise arrived, awaited me in Saigon, as the little crippled girl had returned. She has an extra high boot, but the leg is no longer withered. It is still smaller than the other and always will be, but it is much stronger. She now walks without crutches, and when she learns to handle the boot better, it will be difficult to know the leg is not normal, particularly with Vietnamese national dress, which has long silk pantaloons underneath and a light flowing sort of Cheong Sam over the top. It completely covers the legs. Aunt Lillian must have asked for more details. Letter to Aunt Lillian, 9 January 1971, Viz News Office, Singapore. The little girl in Saigon is well. It's remarkable when one sees her leg. It's still in a brace and probably will be for most of her life, but it's practically the same size as the other. Before, it was just a withered, tiny little flapping piece of almost nothing. No, she doesn't know that I helped her much. She only knows that I helped arrange for doctors to look at her. I don't think it really matters that she doesn't know. Probably better otherwise. We are just friends, as I am with the rest of her family. So if they are genuinely pleased to see me, then I don't have to wonder if it might be partly because I gave them money or helped in some other way. Very clearly, he didn't want to buy his friends he also didn't want to profit from the wars that he covered, but he seems to have enjoyed getting paid and making money. It's a very complicated mixture, but that's Neil Davis, combat cameraman from Tasmania, who spent 22 years covering Southeast Asian combat apart from other places, as well as 11 years of combat in Vietnam. And as I like to say, he was the only non-Vietnamese who spent that much time in combat during the Vietnamese War. Therefore, he is the foreign correspondent planetary expert in what happened in Vietnam who did what to whom and why and what they all thought they were doing. Stay tuned because the next chapter is with the Viet Cong. Wobbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.